Today, responsible citizens of the world concerned with global politics are watching with intense interest the land of India, most difficult administrative problem of the British Empire and home of one of the oldest and most complex of existing civilizations. Here on a vast peninsula, about equal in area to the continent of Europe, excluding Russia, dwell nearly 400 million people, split into a bewildering diversity of religious sects. Notable among them are 92 million followers of the Prophet Muhammad, who, though intensely pious, are also practical and democratic. But by far the largest proportion of the Indian people, some 75%, are members of a mystic and introspective sect, the Hindus. Through both their religion and their carefully graded social system, Hindus are profoundly antagonistic to the Muslims. In Hinduism, side by side with genuine piety, there exist practices which no European can understand. For the daily life and habits of every orthodox believer are ritualized and regulated less by reason or necessity than by a priestly tradition whose origins are lost in antiquity. The followers of the Hindu gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, believe in the mystical doctrine of reincarnation, which asserts that man lives not one life on earth, but many successive ones. And the strict observance of ritual and religious good works is the only way in which the soul can be assured of perpetual progress to a higher plane. From the cradle to the grave, Hindu thoughts and deeds are dictated less by any concern for material well-being in the present life than by preparation for the life to come. Unique feature of Indian life is the rigid system of caste by which all orthodox Hindus are bound to marry within their own class and to remain in the social station and profession of their fathers. At the very bottom of the caste system are India's 49 million untouchables, pariahs, who are excluded by their birth from any part in the social and religious structure of orthodox Hinduism. Today, in spite of all efforts by the British and by Indians like Gandhi to improve their lot, they remain outcasts beyond the pale. To the pious Hindu, the mere shadow of a parrier falling upon him means defilement, for untouchables are believed to be undergoing just punishment for sins committed in an earlier incarnation. Above the pariahs are thousands of castes and subcastes, membership in which predetermines the social standing and often the occupation of every Hindu, whose daily relations with his own and other castes are rigidly prescribed by custom. And though modernization continues to make inroads against ignorance and poverty, both Muslims and Hindus cling to their ancient cultures deeply encrusted with tradition and religious conservatism. Yet another source of disunion in India is the fact that she is composed of some 500 feudatory states, each with its native prince, whose realm may vary in size from a few villages to thousands of square miles. In the hands of a few of these rulers, retaining their thrones only through treaty agreements with the British, are concentrated some of the world's most enormous private fortunes, while others derive too little from their tax revenues to enrich themselves or to improve the lot of their subjects. Many of India's Rajas and Maharajas are loyal supporters of British rule, to which they owe much of their powers. Others, on the contrary, would welcome its overthrow as a chance to enlarge their holdings and gain still more power. Long a problem to the British, India became a world problem in 1942 when it faced the imminent threat of a Japanese invasion. To win the cooperation of its 400 million natives in their own defense, Britain offered in exchange to give India full dominion status after the war.
But though many Indians realized that Japan was a far greater enemy than Imperial Britain had ever been, the old distrust of each other and of the British prevailed. Thus, the world was not surprised when this seething nation of conflicting leaders, religions, and purposes proved unable to agree on any workable terms of independence. Most influential among the factional leaders whose diverging views and principles made agreement impossible is an aged Hindu philosopher, the sainted Mohandas K. Gandhi. Even in the face of Japanese invasion, he continued to preach his doctrines of non-violence and passive resistance. To his number one disciple, the less visionary Jawaharlal Nehru, Gandhi turned over the leadership of India's most powerful political group, the All India National Congress Party, which since 1916 has been striving to win complete independence for India. Its four and one half million members, including both Muslims and Hindus, were determined that they would not actively cooperate with Britain or the United Nations against the Axis until India had been given full independence on its own terms. Spokesman for a large group of India's Mohammedans is the leader of the All India Muslim League, Mohammed Allah Jinnah. In direct conflict with the Congress Party's request for national independence, he has demanded that Britain create a separate and independent state out of those provinces in which Muslims predominate. Among lesser factions, the most uncompromising is the Hindu Mahasabha, whose party chiefs oppose with equal tenacity the Muslims, the Congress Party, and the British Raj. Economically, much of India is still at a rudimentary stage of development. Though its wealth in raw materials could be made to yield far more than it does, 75% of its population still earn a bare subsistence by toiling endlessly at primitive agriculture. With the British handicapped by Indian religious differences from instituting any reforms which might interfere with established customs, Indian leaders themselves have sought to create a better social system. Some, like Gandhi, by rejecting Western materialism. Others, like Nehru, by advocating socialism. But the people of India, disagreeing over policies, parties and leadership, are united in only one thing the determination to throw off British domination and work out their problems by themselves in their own way. While the British have dominated India, they have also aided in her enlightenment to the betterment of millions of Indians. Under the influence of Western education, the women of India, once held by tradition to an inferior position in the social structure, are now taking an increasing interest in such professions as medicine and teaching. But though year by year the government has been increasing the educational opportunities for both men and women, nine out of 10 of India's 400 millions are still illiterate, unable either to read or write. Should the vast potential reservoir of labor of India's teeming millions, a fifth of all the working hands in the world, one day be set to work in the development of native industries, Enlightened Indians know that their land will see an abrupt and dramatic rise in her standard of living. As an example of the achievements possible under such beneficent use of native labor, some of the English point with pride to the Indian state of Mysore. Here, the despotism and tyranny of a few generations ago have been replaced at British insistence by a benevolent and forward-looking government. Under a Maharaja who has shown concern for the well-being of his people, Mysore enjoys a limited democracy and a measure of progress unsurpassed in any native state or province. Wherever British capital has sponsored industrialization, the people of India have also benefited by the development of natural resources previously left untouched and by the creation of new employment. In recent years, Indian capital and Indian enterprise as well have played an increasing part in the country's economic life. Throughout the land are large numbers of British-built dams, 
which supply hydroelectric power in immense quantities and feed the biggest system of artificial irrigation in the world. During the dry seasons, which alternate with the heavy downpours of the monsoons, the waters held in storage by these dams are released through hundreds of thousands of miles of canals and irrigation ditches to transform enormous areas of arid land into fertile and productive plains. No longer is India regularly plagued with the devastating droughts, which once brought famine and pestilence to wipe out whole sections of the population. Now India irrigates a total area 22 times as great as that irrigated by federal projects in the United States. But the very measures which have helped to lower an appalling mortality rate have only complicated the Indian problem. For India is already overcrowded, and its birth rate is increasing by millions every year. Neither industry nor agriculture on the present scale is capable of absorbing the ever-mounting excess of a population doomed to poverty by its very size. Of the inhabitants of the world today, one out of every five persons is an Indian. Thus, India remains more than any other geopolitical section, a storm center of conflicting creeds and social groups. But men of goodwill throughout the world, looking at this immense and densely populated subcontinent, still hope that Indian leaders, steeped in the age-old wisdom of their land, may yet bring India to a position of dignity, prosperity, and peace. A peace commensurate with the spiritual profundity and rich resources of this ancient, yet vital, civilization. Music